We're going to return to a molecular analysis of tumors. And as you know, tumors are complicated. There are multiple different cells within a tumor. They're infiltrating cells. And our next speaker is Dr. Mario Suva, an assistant professor of pathology at MGH, who's really uh, set the stage for the highest complexity of single cell analytics at the genomic level. Mario. Thank you, Daniel, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. and. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is indeed uh, our ongoing efforts in my lab about characterizing uh, brain tumors at the single cell level. Um, I started my lab a couple of years ago and uh, I actually decided that that was an interesting direction to follow. Um, and so, you know, we all know that cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. Um, we all know that um, there are probably multiple genetic clones represented here in different colors and that um, these uh, clones emerge through branch genetic evolution of an original clone um, that uh, initiated the cancer. So, you know, when we do the current standard genomic approaches, we're really trying to decomplex and deconvolute uh, uh, multiple genetic clones and try to reconstruct how this tumor evolved. And to some extent, at least for genomics, it works pretty well. Even though uh, single cell analysis can provide additional spatial uh, information, um, for genomics, uh, even bulk analysis have actually a pretty good resolution. But there are additional layers of information that we're missing when we do this kind of analysis, which is that we all know that cancer cells, in addition to the genetic information, have other type of information. So uh, they can have properties dictated by development. They can have properties dictated by uh, where they sit in the tumor, by microenvironmental stimuli. And so there's a whole layer of functional diversity to cancer cells that, um, again, it can be captured by functional assays, but typically when you do the functional assays, then you miss the genomics. So it's really hard to get a comprehensive view of all the layers of complexity that define uh, any cancer in a patient. So the approach we've taken in the lab is to uh, rely heavily on single cell RNA sequencing technologies. And the reason for that is because in a single assay, when you do single cell RNA sequencing, you can get information about, of course, the cell type, because any given cell has a specific identity that's dictated by uh, molecules of RNA that ascribe it, it uh, cell uh, function. Uh, you can get information about cell state, because the same cell performing two different tasks will have different transcriptional signatures. For example, I'll show you an example, uh, proliferation and cell cycle. The same cell, while proliferating, will acquire new uh, markers. Uh, you can use uh, and identify landmark genes that allow you to uh, locate cells within the tissue. Uh, you can, um, again, kind of in analogy to cell state, identify cellular state transition uh, between uh, two cell identities. And finally, because RNA captures uh, transcripts uh, when expressed, if they're mutated, you can get uh, some level of genetic resolution that allow you to, uh, uh, in addition, get um, uh, lineage tracing information. So the example I'm going to talk about today is in oligodendroglioma. It's a specific subset of brain tumor um, um, that is uh, um, uh, characterized by mutation in IDH1 and co-deletion in 1P19Q. So very uh, well-defined uh, entity. Uh, and what we do is that we collect uh, samples at surgery, uh, prepare single cell suspensions, and then select cells based on only one criteria, which is viability. So we uh, select cells that are being alive. We sort them in 96 well plates, and then we do single cell uh, library preparation. So here's an example based on three tumors in which we sequence about 1,000 single cells in each tumor. And currently, we've doubled these efforts. We're at six tumors with 6,000 single cells. And so the first challenge when you do this kind of analysis is trying to reconstruct uh, what you're dealing with, because we're only uh, selecting cells for being alive. So how do we know if we're dealing with a cancer cell, with an immune cell, with a stromal cell? Um, and so we relied on a very basic algorithm, which um, actually takes RNA information and assumes that if there is a change in expression of hundreds of genes by chromosomic location, maybe that reflects a change in the copy number of the genome. It's a kind of an old you know, microarray algorithm to reconstruct CNV based on RNA sequencing, but it actually works pretty well. And uh, if we use this algorithm, it, it tells us that the vast majority of the cells we're looking at have a loss of signal over 1P and a loss of signal over 19Q, the two signature copy number changes for this kind of tumor. So it tells us that these are uh, likely cancer cells uh, and have additional CNV, and then the other cells are copy number neutral. We have other ways to identify cancer cells and to know that uh, these are normal cells and these are um, uh, cancer cells also based by uh, ju just expression profile. 
But for example, in addition to the copy number changes that are signature, it allows us to identify additional copy numbers that are uh, subclonal, for example, in this tumor. And uh, while this is uh, low uh, genetic resolution information, it's still genetic resolution uh, information coming from cells from which we have whole um, um, transcriptome information. So we we're able to begin to get both the genetic and non-genetic information from these cells. So what do we learn? So we do, we do unsupervised analysis of the data. We learn that in oligodendroglioma, when you do a, a, a completely, uh, again, unbiased analysis by a principal component, there are two dominant transcriptional programs. Uh, one is highly reminiscent of astrocytic lineage, and one is highly reminiscent of oligodendrocytic lineage. So two dominant glial cell types in the normal brain, both present within this cancer, um, uh, in, in cancer cells identity. Now, because we sequence a lot of cells, we actually were able to pick up rare populations, so populations that do not come up immediately in the analysis, but that we need to uh, further look for. And when we uh, continue the analysis going beyond this level of, uh, of transcriptional information, we pick up a third program, which is depicted here, that has SOX4, SOX11, SOX2 within it, uh, all genes that people working in the neural stem cell field know for a long time as being associated with neural stem cell identity. And actually, if we look in a completely unbiased way for this whole signature into normal cell types in the human brain, they're mostly resembling neural stem cells and neuroprogenitor cells. So now we have three cell identities that we can ascribe each cancer cell. And this is plotted here. So you can take a cancer cell and ask what is its cell identity. And the cell identity will be, for some rare cells, a, a neural stem cell identity. And for the vast majority, a glial lineage, either astrocytic glial lineage or oligodendrocytic lineage. We have, of course, this pattern is seen across all the tumors we've analyzed, and uh, we've looked in, uh, to it in tissue with RNA-ish. Now, we've asked the next very simple question, which is to ask where does self-renewing capacity come from in these tumors? And again, we rely on transcriptional signatures for different phases of the cell cycle that we can identify. And we plot all this information um, together. And we come up with, with the same plot I've just shown you, but now we've color-coded cells that are proliferating. And the surprising finding, to some extent, was that uh, self-renewing and uh, mitotic activity is restricted to the stem cell compartment of these tumors. So only cells that have not undergone differentiation are actually uh, cycling in these tumors. And this is true in one tumor. It's true across all the tumors we've analyzed so far. And it's also true uh, across the TCGA data set. When you define de novo the signatures you're looking for, and here we're looking for an association between a stem cell signature that we've defined and a, a, a cell cycle signature. So uh, a very clear architecture in this tumor that seems to be uh, dictated by uh, stem cells and glial lineage programs. Now, we still haven't answered the main question, which is that this could still be all genetics. So one could say that this is a genetic clone that is highly proliferating, and these are other genetic clones that are not proliferating for whatever reason. But really, we're not looking at developmental programs, but rather we're looking at genetic subclones. So uh, we tried to address this kind of key question in the st cancer stem cell field that has been uh, going on for almost a decade. And what we did was the following thing. So first of all, I've shown you that we can reconstruct copy number changes with RNA, RNA sequencing signatures. So uh, we can identify subclones by copy number change, and then we can ask, okay, what is the cell identity within these two sub, with these subclones we identify? So in one example, this is one tumor. We detect two clones by CNV. One clone is here in green, one clone is here in gray. You can see both clones span the developmental tree that I've just highlighted. Both clones contain stem cells and glial cells of both lineages. This is a very low genetic resolution. Can we do anything better? So we did a whole exome sequencing for all the tumors we've analyzed from the same region from which we extracted single cells for RNA sequencing. We called all the subclonal genetic events that were identified across the tumors, there were 18 of them. And then we asked, can we identify those subclonal genetic events in single cells? And if we do, can those genetic events explain a compartment? And actually what we found here are four examples, but it's true across all the examples we've tried. The mutations were detected in all the compartment. The stem cell compartment, the astrocytic or the oligodendrocytic compartment shared the same genetic mutations. And again, this tells us that this developmental architecture that we're highlighting cannot be explained by genetics. We looked even further into a, a known driver of oligodendroglioma pathogenesis. So CIC is a recurrent mutation in oligodendroglioma, but it's not an initiating event. It's, it happens during progression. So uh, we identified a tumor in which we had a subclonal genetic mutation in CIC and then devised a specific single cell qPCR assay to increase our capacity to do genetic callings from RNA transcripts and again identified either a, a, a population of cells that is wild type for CIC in green and a population of cells that is mutant for CIC in red. 
And again, when we overlay cell identity and CIC mutation and status, we can see that both clones span the entire uh, developmental tree that we've highlighted. And of course, as CIC mutation occurs, the tumor evolves and we can pick up a transcriptional signature of the CIC mutation, but that does not affect uh, or impact on the um, developmental tree that we've defined. So I think these assays are really powerful in extracting a lot of information from cancer cells. And in this particular case, really tells us that we should probably really focus on developmental programs and cell identity and phenotypes rather than run after each genetic mutation because what is driving proliferation in this particular tumor type uh, seems to be uh, stem cell identity. And with that, I have a lot of people to thank, but I'm out of time.